Today I'm outside of Fairbanks at the Trans-Alaskan Pipeline. And this pipeline is a part of the Trans-Alaskan Pipeline System, which includes 11 pumping stations, almost 800 miles of this four-foot diameter pipe, as well as multiple, several hundred miles of feeder pipes, as well as the Valdez Marine Terminal, making it one of the world's largest oil pipeline systems. The pipeline was built between 1975 and 1977, due in part to the 1973 oil crisis. Price rises and increased income meant that exploration projects that were going on in Prudhoe Bay suddenly became much more economically feasible. And because of those price increases, legislation also led to it being much easier for drillers to begin drilling anywhere they really needed to in order to start extracting the oil. Oil was known to be in the area of northern Alaska for thousands of years. Indigenous populations were using oil-soaked peat as a source of both heat and light. And all throughout the early part of the 20th century, there was known to be oil in the area, although drilling and exploring for oil in the northern part of Alaska in the early part of the 20th century had never really been worthwhile. Throughout the 50s and 60s, though, Richfield Oil Company, which eventually became ARCO, had begun drilling and was successful finding what was 25 billion barrels of oil underneath Prudhoe Bay, which was the largest in North America. The problem was, how do you get that oil to market, and is it worth drilling to do so? Multiple different sources came up with ideas as to how to actually get that oil from the northernmost part of Alaska all the way to a place where you can bring it to market. Those ideas included ice-breaking oil tankers, a proposal by General Dynamics actually suggested tanking submarines to go underneath the Arctic ice, and Boeing came up with the RC-1, which was a 12-engine jet that would be used to fill up tanks the size of a 747 on each wing and fly it back from the northern part of Alaska. Of course, none of these were really potentially feasible with the exception of the ice-breaking oil tankers, but even ice-breaking oil tankers had significant issues which led to one and only result, and that is this, the Alaskan pipeline, which would be needed to go from where it was drilled all the way to the nearest port that was free of pack ice. And that was in the southern part of the state at Valdez, over 640 miles away. Now, construction began in 1974 with tens of thousands of people working on the pipeline system, and during long hours and brutal conditions through some of the most harsh terrain that someone can really build anything. The amount of money and the population increases led to booms in towns like Fairbanks. That of course brought an influx of crime and seedy behavior. But workers finding wages to be higher than anything else they could potentially get in the local area flooded to work on the pipeline, leaving pretty much teenagers to fill all the vacant roles to the point where high schools in Fairbanks were running two separate shifts because most of the teenagers in the local area were actually working eight hour a day jobs and weren't able to spend all their time in high school. The pipe itself rests on its supports. There's no welding or bolts fixing it in place. And this is because throughout the year, temperatures swing 150 degrees, causing expansion and contraction to the point where the pipeline actually grows over five miles during the summer. And the pipeline itself is 11 miles longer than it needs to be to account for all this expansion and contraction. Additionally, it's built to withstand forest fires and natural disasters, and parts of it are actually on slides in order to deal with the fact that it crosses the Denali Fault, which allows it to adjust 20 feet horizontally as well as 5 feet vertically, which was put to the test during an earthquake several years ago. Now, of course, threading a 4-foot wide pipe 800 miles across the state to include indigenous populations' lands filled with fossil fuel it's bound to cause some controversy, and since its inception, the pipeline has been the focus of environmental, legal, as well as political debate. Most recently, due to the fact that the potential for drilling in the ANWR, or the Alaskan National Wildlife Refuge, would eventually lead to the pipeline system here and down into Valdez. And although incidents are rare, there has been history of leaks, explosions, as well as drunken gunmen shooting holes in the side, resulting in oil pollution and, in rare cases, injuries. Although, due to the size of this system, it's exceptionally rare that anything catastrophic happens. Now, as renewable energy use increases and decline in production could result in serious problems for the pipeline, especially due to the fact that 
The state of Alaska is required by law to remove all traces of the pipeline after oil extraction is complete, whenever that may be. Until then, though, the oil's going to keep on flowing. If you enjoy the content, subscribe. And as always, until next time, get lost.